Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose names has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. All right, thank you, Bo. Let's take our Bibles, make sure you've got them open there, whatever form that you have, and I have the scriptures above as well. But I think it's really good for you to follow along in the text of your scripture uh, as we walk through the book of Revelation. And I'm conscious every time that I come on here on a Sunday morning, we have guests, uh, and we have people who are watching uh, for the first time, and maybe you've come into the middle of a series. We're doing a series on the book of Revelation. And that just means different things to different people. If you're a, like me, I grew up in church, and I've been hearing people preach about Revelation all these years. I've preached through Revelations a few times in my, as a pastor, and so it's very familiar stuff for me. And so these terms like the beast and the antichrist just sort of roll off my tongue, and I, and I have a concept of what I'm talking about. Uh, but then there are others that are here that maybe this is really odd sounding to you. Beasts coming out of the sea, beasts coming up out of the earth, dragons with seven heads and ten horns and diadems on the horns. What in the world does all of this mean? And so my job, and I really take this seriously, is to try to help you understand what uh, is underneath all of this, where it's pointing, and to also help us battle. Uh, all of us have been trained a little bit in Revelation, where we want, whether we wanted to or not, by Hollywood, because there's all sorts of movies. They love the idea of the apocalyptic times and about Antichrist and the Omen and all of these kind of things. So you've you've had a little bit of discipleship by Hollywood, which is not the best kind of discipleship, uh, but you have a little bit of that. And so I want to show you the root in chapter 13, where we of, of where we get this concept of a beast of the coming beast. And while we think of it in terms of two things, we think of it in terms of an organization, a world government, and that's what you see in these first 10 verses, is a coalition of governments, of kings, of powers that are given authority. And this authority is also undergirded by the one we saw in chapter 12 who was just thrown out of heaven to earth. And who was that? Satan himself. So chapter 13, the vision picks up with the Satan, this dragon who's been thrown down to earth. Now he's coming up through a sea, a multitude of people. That's what the sea represents in this symbolism. It's the sea of humanity. You've used that term maybe. And we see this organization of, that, that takes over the world. And we see this famous symbol that you've heard about called 666. That's where we get it at the end of this chapter. You'll see it uh, when we come to it. It says, this calls for wisdom, verse 18. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, there has been all of this, op- this attempts to figure out, is 666, I know what it means. I got you. It's www. Right? It's the internet. The internet is this beast. Well, I don't know. And so you'll find uh, attempts to say the Greek letter for W or the corresponding is six. 
and that may be the case. We don't know, but uh, for sure, I don't, I don't think. And so my job is not to help you identify the coming Antichrist or the identifying beast this morning, because we're going to see the identifying factors, but it's important for us to understand the imitation Christ so that we embrace and do not resist the true Christ, right? We don't want to be fooled. And what you see in these end times events in the tribulation period is the full might and power and personality of Satan himself and all of his demons just infiltrate humanity in a, in a way it never has. It's been thrown to earth and it rises up through humanity in the form of this political beast. But then we see something happen. We see that out of this political organization rises one authoritative person, a little horn, who comes and they begin to submit their authority to this one really charismatic leader. And it is there that we, we begin to see through the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation that there is not just the political organization, there is the personification of this beast in one individual. And this beast, as we read in these verses today, will experience some sort of what looks to the world like a miraculous healing. He receives a wound that is a mortal wound. It should have killed him, or it does kill him. And so we have basically a false prince with a false resurrection, and the world falls for it. But it is important that we understand this term. There is a lot of Scripture, more than I can get into this sermon, about this coming Antichrist, and there is a, that it warrants us taking some time to understand what God is trying to show us and to look at this individual, to look at this political gathering, and then we're going to see a great religious beast, a spiritual beast that comes alongside of this political Antichrist to uh, promote his, his work and to promote him. And eventually we see, as we do in this text, we see the world worshiping the beast who's full of Satan himself. And so let's take a look at these things. And I want to start with the perspective of a couple of apostles, just so you see the setting. Because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is trying to, uh, to quiet this church down and, and encourage them. They got really ruffled because some false teachers have said, hey, Jesus has already come. You missed it. He said, no, it hasn't come. Let me remember what I've taught you. Look at verse 3. It says, let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come unless something happens first. There's a rebellion, apostasy within the church, and a man of lawlessness is revealed. And that's an individual. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Paul refers to this coming one as a man of lawlessness. Why? Look at verse 4. Because he opposes and exalts himself against every God, not just Yahweh, not just the God of Israel, but every object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, we know who really wants to be God. That's Satan himself from the very beginning. He says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know that what is restraining him now uh, so that he may be revealed uh, in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now sort of a traditional dispensational understanding of this is that the, what is restraining uh, Satan from fully bringing out this, uh, this political worldwide religion and this worldwide government and this, uh, this worship of the beast and Satan himself is some type of restraint. And, and traditionally we think of that as the church itself and that the rapture would happen and, and this would take so many believing people out of the world, all believing people out of the world, that it would just uh, take the salt, the preserving factor of this world, the salt and the light out. Now, there would be people being saved during this tribulation period, but at the very beginning, it would just unleash 
and the man of lawlessness would make his appearing. Make his appearing. But here's the point I want us to catch. And this is why we should study it. Look at verse 7. The man of lawlessness is not here yet. Well, maybe he's here in the mix and it's going to happen soon. But if, if I'm raptured out with the church, I'm not going to run into the man of lawlessness when he is the full-blown antichrist. But here's what I am facing and you're facing. We may not be facing the man of lawlessness, but in verse 7 it says we're facing the mystery of lawlessness. It is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And then when the restrainer moves, look at verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. Now that's talking about at the second coming. When Jesus comes, he'll just destroy uh, the beast and the false prophet and throw them into the lake of fire, and he'll bring to, to nothing uh, their activities. And verse 9 says, And the coming of the lawless one will be, uh, is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. There are going to be signs and wonders. But we need to be discerning. We need to be wise. And he's going to be coming with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. And here, this is where you really ought to listen in, folks. Because those who are perishing refused to love the truth. They refused to love the gospel. They refused to accept salvation by grace through faith in Christ. They rejected the offer of salvation God has given to the world. They refused to love the truth and be saved. And so the mystery is already at hand. The man is on his way. Now, 1 John echoes this. This is a different apostle. The apostle John, a couple decades later, he's writing to his church. He talks about the man of lawlessness, this antichrist person that's coming, but he uses a different term, one you and I are more familiar with. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. He says, children, it is the last hour. Some of you are thinking, this has been a long hour. It's been the la it's, we're still in this last hour. And, and as you have heard that antichrist is coming so now many antichrists have come therefore we know it is the last hour this could be somewhat confusing particularly if you're just kind of picking this up i thought pastor you just said there's one antichrist and he's coming now john says many antichrists have come well it's the same idea listen to what he says they went out from us but they were not of us now now wait a second what does he mean us they were, went out from us. They were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they are not all of us. He says, there is, you've heard the Antichrist is coming, but there are many Antichrists that have already come, and they have come out of us. A lot of us are watching television. We're, lucky, we're wondering which political leader that's rising up around the world is going to be the Antichrist. And you might be having betting pools at your office on this. I don't know, or in your Sunday school class. Don't do that, by the way. It's probably not good. Uh, you're probably thinking, who is it? And John says, there are many, and they're coming out of the church. Stop looking on the television. We have Antichrist inside the body of Christ. Or pretending to be a part of the body of Christ, they're coming out from among us. And many have come, and they were coming in, in John's day. Now, what does he mean by that? I haven't seen any really wicked, uh, terrible people coming up out of the church. But in 1 John chapter 4, here's, what he, here's where he's, what he's talking about. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, he says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Even if they're in the church, even if they have the label Christian, if they are not confessing Jesus to be God incarnate, crucified on a cross as a substitute for our sin, risen from the dead and coming again, if they are not confessing Christ as he has revealed himself in Scripture, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. They are anti 
Christ, right? This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So John uses a different term. Paul says the man of lawlessness. We see Revelation chapter 13 is talking about the beast and the little horn talking about in Daniel, this, this, this little wicked ruler, this wicked ruler who rises up, this man of lawlessness, this wicked ruler, this personified beast of Revelation is also this Antichrist. And the spirit that is going to be personified in the person of the Antichrist is at work already among us. You heard he was coming, and now it is in the world already. But listen to this comforting verse, and I probably could finish the sermon here. Look at verse 4. Little children, you, however, if you've trusted Christ, you are from who? God. And have overcome that antichrist spirit and the false teachers that John is talking about. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So that just gives us a backdrop to think of these terms the same. There is a political beast, but that organization is personified, I believe, Scripture clearly teaches, will be, will be headed up by an individual. And you can call him the man of lawlessness, you can call him the Antichrist, you can call him the beast, as we see in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. But here's my hope is this is to help us avoid being deceived by the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit and deception of the Antichrist that is very active in our world and even in our churches today. So with that in mind, let's look at Satan's prince, Satan's prophet, and Satan's people with the time that we have left. Let's look at Satan's prince Call him the great pretender. I think that was a cool song, wasn't it? The great pretender. Satan has always wanted to put forth one. He tried to do it the easy way. And I see a lot of what is going to happen in this tribulation period. Actually, what Satan came along and offered Jesus in the wilderness. Remember, Jesus was being tempted by Satan. He came and he said, listen. I know you've got this plan to redeem earth, but I'm going to make it easier for you. If you'll bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. What was Satan offering Jesus in the wilderness? Exactly what he gives this prince in Revelation, this false prince. That would have been the greatest coup of all time if somehow he could have... Uh, persuaded Jesus, and I don't know that that was possible, persuaded Jesus to deny the heavenly father and follow Satan himself. But that's what he's going to do. And here we see Satan's prince in a picture. It's interesting in these first couple of verses, we see some descriptions that remind us of the book of Daniel. We see a beast coming up out of the sea that's out of humanity, this organized group this incredible empire and in verse 2 it says he's got the form of a leopard he's got the feet of of a big bear and a mouth like a lion now why is John revealing it this way why has God given it to John this way well it is to connect revelation to the prophecy given to Daniel several hundred years before Jesus and in that prophecy Daniel sees a series of beasts the first beast was a, a beast like a lion, and that was, he, God gave him the interpretation, said that's Babylon, who was this, this first great world empire that pursued Israel and destroyed Israel. And then the next one was the Medes and the Persian, and they were represented in Daniel's dreams as a bear. And then a third beast arose out of, in Daniel's visions, and that was in the form of a leopard, and that represented Greece under Alexander the Great. So there were, these beasts of Daniel are world empires. And then in this fourth beast, there's a fourth beast in the book of Daniel that comes out that is more ferocious than any, and it is this beast that, that God is showing John, even though it kind of 
went underground for a period of time, it is not obliterated, it is not gone. And that was none other, none other than Rome, this terrifying beast. And he describes it in Daniel chapter 23. He says, and as for the fourth beast, or 7, 23, he says, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms and it shall devour the, what? The whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And on that beast in the book of Daniel, it says there were ten horns and out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise. So he says this beast will have ten horns like the one in Revelation. And another shall rise after those ten, and he shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three. And so there's going to be this little horn that comes up and is going to take rulership over three. And then eventually, they're all going to uh, give their authority to this, this sudden arrival of this incredibly charismatic, powerful leader who's going to take control of this fierce worldwide beast. You think, well, this empire obviously was Rome. Well, Rome uh, did do that. And many Roman Caesars persecuted and came against the people of God. And there were many rulers that rose and fall. But when you add verse 25 to it, you see that there's going to be something even greater to come. And this hasn't quite happened. That's why I think this is in the future. Look at verse 25. And he shall speak words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, shall think to change the times and the law. I mean, he's trying to take complete control. And they shall be given the times and the law. All of this authority is going to be given into the hand of this powerful, growing king, the Antichrist, They'll be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, if you've been with us in this series, you know that that is, that is code for three and a half years. That's what a time was. Because we're looking at this, uh, and that connects it to the seven-year tribulation period that I think is still yet to come in the future. And we derive that idea from Daniel as well. But what you can't do is you can't divorce Daniel from the book of Revelation. To understand Revelation, you have to understand that it is taking its language and it's taking its meanings from the book of Daniel. And, G and, and, and John is saying there will be a future and there will be a revival of that Roman beastly kingdom that is going to be far worse, far more fierce. It's going to have the... Sh the shape of the leopard, it's going to have the claws of the bear, it's going to have the mouth of this lion, and it's going to have all of the authority of the dragon. So you've seen the portrait. Look at the, the power, where he gets the power from, and it's in the verse, end of verse 2. It says, and to, uh, of Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, it says, and to it, the beast, the dragon gave its power and his throne and his great authority. Now that's a lot because the scripture could have just said that the dragon, and we knew that from last week we saw this dragon is Satan. But it says he gave him his power. That's a different word from his throne and great authority. And each of these words have a lot of, of meaning packed into him. The, the, the power is his inherent ability. His throne is his authority over his forces. And so this coming uh, Antichrist will have, you talk about a, a spy network, <laughs> a good intelligence network. A third of the angels of heaven have fallen, and now he has uh, the very power and authority and jurisdiction of Satan himself in this coming kingdom, this coming empire. And then we see that he has exousia, great authority, great authority. No wonder the world falls right into his hands. I mean, you've studied history enough with me, and you've seen the history of our world. Have you ever wondered how nations, how would a whole nation fall for Hitler? You know, how would a whole nation just follow 
blindly some of the leaders? How do people just kind of fall in line? It's, 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 it's maddening sometimes. And just imagine, I believe that there was definitely demonic and satanic activity in a person like Hitler. He was involved in the occult in many ways. But I don't think he's anything compared to the charisma and ability and power that will be given to this final personification and incarnation of Satan, of Satan's prince. And so we see his portrait, we see his power, we see his popularity. It says that the entire world will worship the dragon. The entire world. They will marvel when they see this wound that he's healed from. And they will be saying to one another, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And people just cave in and say, we'll give away our rights. We'll give away our borders. We'll give away our constitutions. We'll give away our uh, way of life. We'll give away all of these things. And you'd say, why would any nation, why would any people group do this? Because this this antichrist and we take this kind of from daniel i believe is going to have the ability to unite the spiritually the spiritual authorities behind everything to unite them to bring about a peace in the middle east that we've never been able to have to bring about coalitions of governments to solve <laughs> russia solve Israel, solve all of these kind of things and bring about treaties and organizations. And, and we see that, don't we? We see that spirit is already at work. And, and some of us as, as, as believers, you might get all excited about, well, we need to break up all those treaty organizations. We need to stop this. Listen, folks, it's not our role to go to the UN and try to break up the UN. We have, a, we have our marching orders, and it is not to go out and find the beast and stop him. Now, we will, we will have part in that, and we need to do our best to elect godly people and put people in place and not participate in, in those things, and we need to keep you know, fighting those battles as best we can. But our ultimate job, you and I have a global initiative You and I have the same initiative that the beast is going to have in those seven years. He is trying to get the entire world to worship Satan. You and I have the same initiative. We are trying to get the whole world to worship who? God. We have a global commission. We're trying to get people to take a mark, but it's not the mark of the beast. It is the mark of the Holy Spirit. We want people to find and hear the gospel, and we are called to go out to the uttermost parts of the earth and have people receive the Holy Spirit. And once they've been marked by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter. They are safe. They are in Christ. They are sealed into Christ, into His promise, into His covenant, and they are, they are safe. Now, we have to be very careful, though. During this time of lawlessness and the mystery and, and the work of the Antichrist, even in the church, we can be deceived and so we need to be alert and 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 by the way satan's work is almost universally popular he does not sneak into governments and sneak into churches with horns you know and what do you call them pitchforks with a tail he's not hiding his tail in the room here and there's not smoke coming off of him that's hollywood He's coming in the form of false teachers and signs and wonders that can be, uh, can fool us. So we need to be careful. And then as we participate in our nation and in, with our neighbors, as we're loving them, we try to help them see, help them see the truth of the gospel. And it's amazing how when the Holy Spirit pulls back the blinders and allows you to see Christ for who he is, you also begin to see the activity of the evil one like you've never seen it before. It just opens up the curtain, and you begin to see like what we were talking about last week. We see the evil one at work, and 
our uh, political systems and educational systems and all of these kind of isms that are around us when you be, when you the holy spirit sets you free that truth allows you to see the work of the enemy and discern with wisdom what is happening but i want to remind you of something look at verse 5 it's important that you get this and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. That's a three and a half year period again. By who? Who allowed this to happen? Well, look at verse 7. Also, it was allowed. The beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Who allowed that? God did. And so we don't need to fear Satan's prince. We just need to trust that even Satan's prince is just a pawn in God's plan. He's absolutely sovereignly in control. And he is bringing about the judgment that we deserve as an earth but, and as a people, but he's, he's allowing this to happen to bring to full fruition what has to happen on planet earth. And when he removes the restrainer, we are going to see Satan make his final stand. And he does so through a political beast. But then second of all, we see a prophet, another type of beast. I call him Satan's prophet who comes alongside of the prince. And his role, if we read this passage, his role is to promote the career of the prince. Verse 11, I saw another beast rising out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. So there's this interesting dichotomy, it's sort of a gentle look like a lamb, but the voice of a dragon. So uh, many interpreters see this as some type of religious figure who is able to do something, I think, even more, more <laughs> miraculous than getting uh, coalitions of nations and European unions and other type of unions, even more miraculous than that is, is getting all of these various religions of the world to cave in to worship the beast. And so we end up with a, a one world pluralistic type religion. And people agree to take down the differences and not make a big deal about the differences. And you'll see what's left of the, of, uh, of the great the, the Christian church You'll see many who call themselves Christians just erase the lines of doctrine. Now we see people trying to do that today and erase the authority of God's word so that we can all just be one big happy family. And why would we do that? Why would people willingly give up even their false beliefs to follow and worship this, this beast, this antichrist? Because this prophet is able to do miracles in their presence. Look at verse 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So we think there's kind of a false type resurrection that happens, or, but everybody's going to see it just like you and I can see everybody that hap everything that happens around the world. We can see it instantly. Uh, we're, they're going to be able to see this and it's going to perform great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. That's a, that's a pretty big trick. But he's going to be able to do this. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to this image. So there's going to be some sort of image that is given power, and it is going to convince people this Prince is the real deal. Real deal. And I think Israel is going to think he has brought peace. This is the political um, prince we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. And perhaps they rebuild the temple, something they've been wanting to do for centuries, and the temple in Jerusalem gets rebuilt, and the world celebrating a peace in the Middle East and this covenant that the Antichrist makes with them. And then he, I can just see, he enters in with all the world to see into this, 
this place that only God is supposed to dwell in. And God's presence doesn't return to the Holy of Holies yet. The Antichrist enters in and turns around and says, I'm here. Worship me. Look what I've done. I can fix all your problems. Worship me. I hear echoes of that, don't you? I hear echoes of that in politicians and powerful people even today, in philosophies and scientists and pastors and preachers. Trust me, I can fix it. Trust me, give me more power, I'll fix it. It's interesting that the number that's associated with the Antichrist is 666. Y'all ever get nervous if that shows up like your bill at the restaurant? (laughs) Or if they try to give you that phone number or something like, no way, man, give me another phone number, not going with that. I want it anywhere in my phone number or my address I'm moving. We're spooked by that number. I don't think you should be spooked by that number. I'm convinced that that number just says, it's not God, it's not God, it's not God. It's man's best effort, it's man's best effort, it's the best we can do. It is a fake prince, a fake prophet, and a fake promise of salvation. The spirit of that is even in some of our religions and even in some forms of Christianity where the teachers would say, you work your way to heaven. You're going to heaven by all of your work. You see how it puts the onus on you as a human being. No matter how, I hope you're following me, but however good I live my life, it still rolls up a six. It's the best I can do. Same with you. I need a seven. I need a divine prince. I need a divine Holy Spirit. I need a divine promise. What you see in this text, and I could preach for another hour and say amen if you're ready for me to stop. But anyway, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But we'll come back to this. But what you see is you see, you see Satan doing what he's always wanted to do. Is to, he's a mimic. He's mimicking the Trinity. Satan, he says, I'm the Father now. I'm the Most High. And I now have an incarnate Son in the flesh. And I want the world to worship him. And when they worship him, they'll actually be worshiping me. And he needs a helper. I'm going to send a helper to my prince. And this helper is going to go around and convict people of their sin and convict people that they need to trust my prince. Does that sound familiar? He's basically creating and mimicking the triune God. And when God removes the restrainer and he releases it on earth, you know what earth is going to get? We are going to get exactly what we've always wanted. A God in our own image. A God that kind of rolls up 666. And then he's going to come along and he's going to say, I know that God of Israel is no longer around. He wasn't the real, but stop praying that prayer. Give us our daily bread. Take my mark. I'll make sure you have your daily bread. Take my mark on your hand or on your forehead. You say, I'm not getting that mark. I don't care what they're going to do. I'm not getting that mark. I don't know that you and I are going to have to worry about that mark. My dog has a chip inside of my dog that dog's going to heaven I don't care he's going to heaven I know he's got a chip but he's not the antichrist dog 
That's another sermon, by the way. I don't know if dogs go to heaven. Just don't quote me on that, okay? So we'll talk. But if, if there were, he would. I'm not, I, I just think that we must be uh, concerned about the mark of the Holy Spirit. You and I have an incredible opportunity. And I don't know if it's going to last five more years or 500 more years. That's not our business. That's God's. We don't know. I will tell you what John told you, the apostle, and what Paul the apostle said, and it is absolutely true. We are in the last hour. And I don't think there's anything between us and the rapture. I don't think there's anything left to happen. And my greatest fear is not that someone in this crowd is that you're going to take a mark or that you're going to not be able to recognize the my greatest fear is you're going to walk out of this room and you've resisted once again the true prince that you've resisted once again the true holy spirit who is calling your heart to follow jesus and that you know what you're doing when you resist christ today you are basically looking at god and saying this six ought to be good enough for you this six, I want you to count me as a seven. I'm good enough. I'm wise enough. I'm smart enough. And you push away the conviction of your sin. And God just continues to love us. And He says, no, you have all fallen short of the glory of God the divine perfection. You, you have sinned and rebelled, and I have sent my seven. I've sent my son. We have come, and we've offered you a bridge to salvation. You can go into covenant with me today through faith in Christ. That's my, that's my hope, is that you will just not push away the true triune God who loves you and wants to give you life. And I'm telling you, His promise of daily bread is true. <laughs> his promise of salvation is true. His promise of peace and joy is true. And if you push it away too far and do not love Jesus and love the truth of the gospel and receive it today, then what you will be left with is 666. An unholy trinity, a false prince, a false prophet, and a false promise, a false hope. That's what you'll be left with. And it's my prayer you won't do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. It doesn't hold back from helping us see uh, the future, what we need to see of it. And Father, there is so much there. There's plenty there to help us make the decision we need to make today. We have a resurrected prince, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you've loved us and you've come and you've laid down your life for your sheep. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will mark us and seal us today if we will turn our hearts towards you. We thank you that when we're marked by you, no other mark can happen. And we thank you that your promise is true. Your daily promises and your eternal promises. And we thank you for it. God, I pray that we would uh, resist the spirit of lawlessness the spirit of the antichrist as a church and his families help us to raise our children to discern right from wrong to see truth help us hold on to the word of scripture and not let it be cast aside even uh, in season and out of season help us to preach the word even when it's contested or unpopular God, we do that because we know we have in you perfection. A perfect Savior. A perfect Sovereign. A perfect Spirit. Thank you for that gift.
with every head bowed, I just, I have to invite you today, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, our great Savior invites you to do so today. You simply turn to Him. You turn away from your best efforts. You turn away from the world's best efforts. You turn away from that which falls short. And you turn to Jesus who finished everything, who was perfect in every way. Turn to Him. Repent of your sins today and ask Him to come in and save you. And He will. He'll give you eternal life as a gift. You can't earn it. He'll give it to you as a gift and He will seal you with His experience. His Holy Spirit. His Spirit will come in to your life, unite with your Spirit eternally. It'll never break apart. Would you trust Christ today if you haven't? You could pray something like this with me if you'd like. You can pray today, Dear Jesus, I have fallen short. I have sinned. I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me and to give me eternal life as a gift that you purchased on the cross. Just pray that to him. He loves to give you his righteousness and take your sin. He loves to do that. And he does that for the glory of the one God and Father who created heaven and earth. You just pray and receive that. And like little Jude, this morning stood there and professed so boldly, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. You need to stand and profess that as well. If you've trusted Christ, you've never been baptized, I invite you to come down this morning. Our prayer team can help sign you up to make that profession of faith boldly like that. If you need more prayer to help you uh, just think through this process, that's what our prayer team's for. If we can help pray for a family member, we're here at the front. But let's not root, leave this room today without committing ourselves to the true prince and his purpose. Father, thank you so much for our time together. I pray that our response will be what, we, what you need to see from our hearts and from our lives. We ask in Christ's name, amen.